Welcome to another episode of At the Table with Patrick Lincioni, the official podcast of our company, The Table Group, where everything we do is about changing the world so that all organizations can be more effective and less dysfunctional, and so that employees can be more fulfilled and less miserable. That means we're going to touch on a variety of topics, all related in some way to the world of work. I'm your host, Pat Lincioni, and if I sound strange, that's because I have a cold. And I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Cody Thompson. Cody, your daughter has a cold, too, I think. Am I right? She does. I'm doing just fine, though. I sound normal. And we have a guest here who's just getting over a cold, Chris Jensen from Portland. How you doing, Chris? I am back, and I'm feeling much better. I sounded like you did last week. Hey, between the between us, we have 10 kids, so it's natural that colds are going to run around our households. I have a very deep voice. I sound like Barry White. But yes. anyway, we're here to do a podcast. Cody, you've got some housekeeping, housekeeping yeah, to before do before we get, we get started, started we, though. We haven't done a commercial in a long time, and so I wanted to tee up. So you've got a new book coming out. It's called The Motive. Yes. Yeah. And what I love about this book is that you self-describe it as basically the first book I should have written. Right. And meaning that in the motive, we look at why leaders become leaders. And if your motive is off, then you have the wrong incentive or motive to be a leader. Yeah. I tell people, if you had a stack of my books and you were saying, which one should I start with? This would be the first one. Right. Because most of your books are about how to lead. Right. This one is about why. Well, and I'll just say this because you probably wouldn't say this about your own book, but this book will make you completely think differently about leadership is going to make you think about your role differently as a leader. And it's a book that is, there's no book like this out there. And that's probably easy to say in a marketing, but (laughs) we live in the world of leadership books, right? And this one will make some statements that I think will cause you to completely think differently about leadership. I totally agree. That's what I love about it. I think that one of the outcomes of this book might be that there are fewer leaders, which is interesting. Most leadership books are inspiring people to be leaders, and we want more of the right leaders and right. and less of the wrong ones. Yeah, That's we right. had a, on the back of the book. There's a great quote from one of our the CEOs who re- read it, who said this book really. What did he say? It blew him rocked away. Me to my core. It rocked him to his core. Yeah, because yeah. it does quest make you question like, why am I being a leader? And hopefully, it helps people adjust to to do it for the right reasons, or maybe to question whether they should be a leader at all. Right. But I appreciate the kind words you guys said. I hope people like it. This is one we would strongly encourage you to pre-order. Pre-order on Amazon. Go out, tell your friends. I mean, this is one that has the potential to shape the landscape. Like killing Pat right now. (laughs) He hates that we're doing this. The longest commercial we've ever done. The only thing I will say is it's short. So even if it's not good, you're going to like the fact that it's short. Great fiction can change the landscape of leadership. Go out to Amazon, get a copy on pre-order. It comes out at the end of February. We'll be doing another podcast on the actual model in there. But wanted to get that out to our listeners in case they wanted to help promote that and get a copy real quick. Okay, enough about that. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get on to the so, podcast. Now on to our topic, which is we're calling hard culture. And Pat, you, you've you done this a couple of times in the past, but to sort your thoughts around this, you wrote something about what we mean by hard culture. And you're going to read that and then we're going to interact with it and get going on the podcast. Yeah, it's something I feel very passionately about. So here, here's how it goes. Company culture has devolved into superficial perks and artifacts like free food, open office space, and bringing pets to work. This is what I call soft culture. Hard culture is real corporate culture, if you will, because it lives in the way that an organization actually goes about running its business. The central pieces of hard culture include the following, who a company hires and rewards and keeps, and who it repels and rejects, how people go about getting their jobs done in a company, and what the leaders of a company focus their time and attention on during meetings, and how they make decisions. So essentially what I'm saying, you guys, is that when people talk about, oh, that company has a neat culture, right. usually they read an article about some silly thing they do, like they have a slide from the second floor to the first floor, or they have free food in the cafeteria or whatever right. else. And that's not really what a company culture is. And it, it really pains me to hear that because we're focusing on the wrong things. The true culture of a company lives in the way it does the work it does and what it's like to be there. And part of the tragedy of this is, most business is not big business. So when you think about right. the companies that have great, and I'm using air quotes here, great company culture, you think of like the Amazons of the world or the Googles of the world where you're riding through the office on your scooter <laughs> and lunch gets paid for you and they pick you up from your home in the morning and shuttle you to work and they do your taxes and your laundry for you. Most companies think of that, but most business is smaller companies who actually are feeling like, how do I compete? Right. And I think this is this is why it's a distri- it's the wrong conversation, as you said. You know, it's funny. Just last week, I had a conversation with the CEO of a, of a very big company in, in Silicon Valley. 
And they were saying, how do we compete against these companies that are doing all these perks? Exactly. And I said, don't try to compete don't on try those. It. Because th those perks in an unhealthy organization are just handcuffs keeping people there when they don't want to be there. The way, what you should really do to change your company culture is make it so clear what success looks like, get your executive team completely aligned and make it so that nobody deeper in the organization has to choose between competing against one another and doing the right thing for their boss. If you can eliminate that kind of frustration, that's right. That's company culture. And, and, and the funny thing is all the executives in the room said, you are exactly right. All those perks don't matter if this is a dysfunctional, confusing, or political place to work. Totally. Let's, let's solve right. those problems. And, and we know this because we see the companies that have a really strong down-to-earth culture where right. getting work done is actually fun. And they have a lot of long-tenured employees. They retain right. their best people. And perks don't retain people. That's, exactly. that's the sort of underlying secret here is, you know, we did some research prior to this that the, the average tenure at one of the most well-known companies in the Silicon Valley is 1.1 years. That is for crazy. An employee. Right. And, and, and it goes crazy. back to, I, I think what was interesting as we were discussing and preparing for this podcast is the idea that really at the end of the day, the underlying message is if you believe, and there are a lot of employees and companies that believe that work is just corporate penance, that it's just drudgery then what you would focus on is how do we make this less painful for people? Let's right. buy them lunch. Let's get them, you know, heated toilet seats. Let's get an infinity pool and some gym classes in here until companies realize that really what retains employees and what satisfies them is that they're dignified in their work, that in they're the work challenged, itself. Yeah. that it's when you said it's how we get stuff done, the company, it doesn't, we know of manufacturing companies in the Midwest that work in, in factories that have excellent hard culture that retain their employees that people want to work at that you could go offer someone 30% raise to leave and they would stay right because of the hard culture and too many people you're right compete against what it looks like what our perks are essentially you know the first two jobs I had were both very difficult places to work but they had lots of perks <laughs> Exactly. One was that we had a beautiful office and free food and they'd buy us dinner from nice restaurants. Of course, they were working us till midnight every night. So that dinner tasted terrible. Right. I would much prefer having Pop-Tarts in my own home, my own apartment. <laughs> and they had free transportation to come to work or go to. But again, none of that really mattered because working there was really harsh. The next place I worked was harsh too, but they had a beautiful gym and incredible cafeteria. And that was great when you Finally got out of work, which you hated to go play basketball. Yeah. But that didn't make me want to go to work the next morning. No. And it's just so symptomatic of a bigger issue. And that is, why not just make it a great place to work and not throw money at something that's really just golden handcuffs? Right. Well, and the throw money part of it is huge because you think of the cost of business with that level of perks. And frankly, it's not just what we have right now and how much we're spending right now, but this stuff is insatiable. What you did yeah. two years ago is not good enough because everyone's looking for what can you do for me now. And when you build an environment where you're just trying to inoculate employees with more and more and more, that's what we expect. Right. The cost to run a business yep. like that is just astronomical. Well, and, and here's the, the, the real thing is what we dream of is a world. This is why we do this podcast. This is why we go out and help companies answer the six questions that we did on this podcast. Absolutely. Because it creates the foundation for what is a real hard culture that is true about the company that isn't just words on a wall or something. It's really lived. And until the companies in general, until 51% of them are competing against making this a dignifying place to work yes, and right. challenging their employees then w there's so much work to be done. Too many of them are looking at this. I mean, w w we have a bunch of articles sitting in front of us because I tried to look up all the best perks around Silicon Valley and other companies. Everything from paid, infinite paid parental leave to freezing your eggs <laughs> to just things you wouldn't even believe until companies stop competing at the, at the compensation and perks level and start competing on the hard culture level. We're going to have a whole generation of workers that bounce around from one company. Yeah, to another. it's it's like a husband saying, "Well, my wife doesn't seem very happy. I better get her some pearls." Right. Or right. I better, or a wife saying, my, "My husband, I think I need to get him a new truck because he's not happy." It's like if you're not focusing on the things that make your marriage happy, right? All the externals are 
are just a distraction, totally. a total distraction. And that's so common. You know, I remember years ago in the big boom of the, of the Silicon Valley, working with one of the famous companies that's now out of business there. And the <laughs> executives were so excited about the culture of their company because they were literally building a slide from the second floor to the first floor. And they were giddy about it. And they talked about how they, they were gonna use it and they were, were the first to go down the slide and employees were just like, what is going on? Right. And their business model wasn't good. And within a year they were done. Yeah. And you just think, why not focus on the fundamentals? Yeah, and let's not just harp on Silicon Valley. That's not oh, the no, case. It's just, no. like, it's just the obvious um, examples that everyone knows that we can point to. But also in this conversation, I often hear that it's like this generational thing. Like, how do we attract and retain millennials? And they think it's a millennial problem, right? That they're enticed by these perks. And what, what struck me as we did some research for this and started talking about this is, when I first entered the workforce, my dad's number one criteria for me to get a job was make sure it has good benefits. You know, he almost bought into the idea that, you know what, every job is going to have is going to be miserable on some level. Right. Just make sure that your family's taken care of, that you have a good health insurance plan and that you have benefits. Right. You know? right. So this is not a, a new phenomenon. In fact, they're just different iterations of this in different generations. And, and, and again, we need more leaders to understand this. We need more people with codified hard cultures, more companies with that. So that uh, uh, the litmus test that we use is if someone came, we're, we're a small company. We have a few perks that are great. We have lunch together. We, you know, we have a lot of camaraderie outside the office. But if, if someone came and tried to poach one of our people by paying them more or offering perks, the answer would be a You'd flat be out of here no. In a second. No, yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> How much more money exactly? Yeah, it'd be a flat no, no though, because yeah. because no. of the the uh, hard culture that we have that we want to be dignified in the work that we do. We find the right ways to motivate people, inspire them to do hard work, and people want to be challenged. Here's what's sad, though. I will say it. So I have sons in college right now, Tracy. You do too, and they're impacted by this stuff. They are. Kids go, hey, I just did an interview with X Y Z company, and you know about them, don't you? You've heard about all these things. They because you can't really market the experience of working there. Right. So they get these kids to work there. I was one once too. And then they go there and they're like, why am I miserable? I have all these things. I mean, somebody's doing my nails right now and I'm miserable. And it's because we're marketing those things instead right. of marketing and talking about the most important things. So I guess what I would say to people listening to this is the grass is not always greener on the other side. And all those things you hear about in articles, it's because there's this war for talent going on right now and they're trying to steal people. But if you do the right things for your people and make their job really meaningful and make it possible for them to succeed, you're not going to have to worry about that. Yeah, I was going to say like an authentic and clear sense of purpose, you know, genuinely cultivated core values that are meaningful within the company. These are the ingredients of a good culture. And we don't think about this enough at work, but how your meetings work is also part of your hard culture. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It is part of your hard culture. And most people hate going, actually, there's a really large company, you know the name, you probably use their software up in the Northwest. And getting work done, you say hard culture is about how work gets done, right. is completely bureaucratic and painful. Everyone hates going to meetings. Everyone knows that the meetings are a necessary evil to get things done, but it's totally political. You know what they need? Free donuts. <laughs> it changes exactly. everything. No, meetings, every every the meeting better. they do. They have, especially like the Gosh. higher up you go in the company, every meeting has this buffet afterwards. And we all know we're just waiting for the meeting to get out so we can go out to that buffet mm. outside the door. What the real culture is and the part that's frustrating people is what happens as soon as we walk into that room. And so I think the sense of purpose and values and clarity in the organization around what, what we're about and then, and then our meetings. Yeah, I think that it's one of the, it, people listening to this might think, well, why would intelligent executives continue to do this kind of stuff? Right. And, and it, it makes me wonder the same thing, but I think about those executives and I've worked with many of them. And when you tell them, you know, what you really need to do is make your leadership team more cohesive and you really need to get clearer about what you're trying to do. And you really need to empower people right. by telling them about that. They just go, oh, screw it. We can just yeah. build a nicer gym. <laughs> That's right. And it's, it's very short-term thinking. It's a little bit lazy, and I don't want to be rude here, and it doesn't have payoffs. Right. And yet, people continue to double down on these things. Right. right. I suppose there's still a lot of people out there buying jewelry for their wives or trucks for their husbands rather than being humble enough to apologize and to be a better family. Well, and, and before we sound like a bunch of old men, Henri on a porch talking about uh, all these companies that are no good, but, but I think it's worth saying that 
like an ideal scenario would be a company that has a great hard culture and has some incredible perks. You know, it's not the perks are, we're not demonizing the perks here. It, it's that that they get a disproportional amount of the energy and attention as opposed to taking the time and, and hard work and discipline to build a hard, hard culture. That's right. Yeah. The, 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 here's the warning about perks though, because you're right. That it's okay to do nice things for your employees. Right. But if you're not building a healthy culture, people feel like they're being bought off. Right. Exactly. I, I remember when I was exactly. in college, I took a social psychology class and they did this thing where they, they asked people to do something for, as a favor. And, and then when they introduced money for it, if the people were inclined to do it without the money, they'd have done it anyway. When you ask them about the money, they go, well, I'm not doing it for the money. So right. that's okay. If you build a great culture, people want to come there and do great work. Mm -hmm. If they feel like you're trying to buy them off by doing things like, like these things, like we're going to, we're going to give you free food at night. We know that's to keep us here. So we don't go home. Right. Exactly. <laughs> right. We're going to give you dry cleaning. Yeah. We, yeah, again, we, we know. know you're trying to steal our personal <laughs> <Right>. lives. <laughs> it's almost insulting. Oh yeah. And so I, I think that just focusing on the non perky ones is so much more helpful. And by the way, some of the best companies I know, don't necessarily pay their people more than their competition mm -hmm. no. and don't do more of the externals. No. Right. And I, I, you know, we've, I've actually had people email us and say, Hey, can you use another example besides Southwest airlines? And the only reason we use this so often is because so many people have experienced them and know them, but imagine like there are so many people, they have a great hard culture. If, yeah. if United or another airline went to go offer one of the, the Southwest employees, like free first class flight flights and a 25% raise, many of them would say no simply because of the culture that they created at Southwest Airlines. That's right. And that's really what we're we're talking about here. And so one thing I would ask you, Pat, as people are listening to this and they're agreeing with sort of the sentiment around this and, and seeing it in the workforce and the workplace, what of the six questions that we've covered on this podcast, which ones do you think lend themselves most closely to like that you have to have answers to to really hardscape their culture? You know, like obviously mm, all of them, question. ideally. Yeah, yeah. All, they all, they all they create all the culture. In different ways, I mean, yeah. at the highest level, you know, why we exist, you know, mm -hmm. why does it matter that this company exists and how do we behave? Those are the clear, the, the values and the, and the reason why we exist. Those are the most important ones. But I think what it comes down to after that is like, do I really understand how to be successful in terms of my day-to-day -day job and where does that fit right. within the rest of the company? Right. So that fl falls into strategy and priorities and who does what. Yep. So I think it's all of them. And I think too many times companies think about only the higher level things like we know what our values are and we know why we exist. Here's a t-shirt with that on it. Right. Go feel great. Yeah. And I think that it's, it's the, the heavier well, lifting and they, and they necessary. prioritize like strategic tactics or like big company goals that employees can't really see where they help with. And so there is, it's too disconnected from the work. So, so employees have a hard time connecting to you know, what we're trying to accomplish. Right. Yeah. You know, I, I think this all lends itself to a conversation about what the office looks like too. Hmm. I'm a huge believer in, in like the physical space, physical space. Oh yeah. But, but physical space in terms of how it helps you to work, right. not in terms of what it looks like what from it, the outside. Aesthetic standpoint. And yeah. I do worry sometimes that companies that build a, an ornate headquarters office, or they, they try to make things too beautiful, that it's actually a misguided attempt to, create a culture. I'd rather work in a cinder block building where people are bouncing off the walls, happy working together right. than in a, what, what would you call it? A country club where people are miserable. Right. And there's a lot of miserable people working in country clubs out there. Yeah, it is so interesting because we, when we go visit clients, that's one of my favorite things to look at is like, what is this building? How does it function operationally? And when people come to our office, they're often surprised. Like, you don't even have an office, you, you know, like you, you have Me, a desk in a room. Yeah. yeah Pat doesn't. I um, turned my office into a lounge for everybody else. Right. I was never in there. <laughs> but it speaks to how we get stuff done. Our whole office is open. We, we sit in our chicken coops or what we like our business units essentially. And, and it facilitates conversation in an open environment where we don't have to have meetings. Like oftentimes we'll overhear a phone call for someone in the content team and go, Hey, let's talk about what you said on that call. And the purpose and, is not to make it impressive to people who visit. The purpose is to make it easy for us to get stuff done. Exactly. Right. right. And, and, and there's just too much of that. Um, and I, you know, the economy's great right now, which is thank God for that. But I think people are trying to compete to hire people and they're, they're putting a lot of time and energy into these aesthetic things, which right. I think go away pretty quickly. Right. And here's what's wild. A friend down. of mine in Portland runs a, I kind of jokingly refer to them as your typical Portland granola company. They're a wood, <laughs> they're a, they're a food product manufacturing company. They make granola, which <laughs> Perfect. is too stereotypical for Portland. <laughs> I love it. 
But this friend of mine, he's been doing a lot of work on his company culture because they were losing a lot of people, tons of turnover. And he was telling me the story last week that one of his one of his employees was super excited because she was listening to her sister talk about how horrible it was to work at her company. And she said, I couldn't wait to come tell you how excited I am that for me, work is not like that. I love right. her. And this is a company where 70% of the employees are are literally shoveling oats into hoppers yeah. to make granola bars. Real work. Like, uh, this is real work. But it's that's not a great fancy. Lit- litmus test, right? When you, How you feel when you pull into the parking lot. We talk about that all the time here. That's a great lit- litmus test for whether you're being enticed by perks or if this has a real hard culture and you're psyched to get some stuff done and to roll up your sleeves and, and do work. And do work. But the, the thing is, is the CEO has focused on the things that you were just talking about. Purpose, values, and helping create an environment where work is done through teams and through collaboration and vulnerability and openness. There's no secrets. And it's just a completely different environment than it was even five years ago. Right. And what that translates into, he, I mean, it, not only her story, but they had the lowest turnover they've had in the history of the company last year. Hmm. And they've, they've not changed perks. Right. I mean, they've, they've made some necessary <laughs> compensation changes, but there was no major perk or soft culture changes in their company. It was, it was the, it was these, this hard stuff yep. that we're talking about. Hard culture. I, right. and, and it's, it's, it's the, the stuff of what you build a company and how you get things done. That's right. Which and, I love. And it's worth saying that every company has a hard culture, like that they're how you get stuff done. There's just very few that do it intentionally. And with the amount of discipline and rigor it takes to make it good. Right. That's and right. If, if your hard culture is bureaucracy and confusion and politics, no amount of Perks soft is, culture is going to cover that up. That's right. What, what to say? Putting lipstick on a pig, right? <laughs> Still right. going to be a pig. <laughs> you know what I think? What, what I think is cool in our office, here's the, here's my favorite part of our soft culture, if you will, is that we have a big wall that I'm looking at right now and where we do our podcasts. And we were like going to have a painting made for it and what would be cool. And we just painted it with stuff we could write on. Right. So now it's a big <laughs> whiteboard. Yeah. It's not very pretty, but it's we're going to use it that way. Exactly. And, and so that our culture is about getting together in rooms and writing and figuring things out and working as teams. So that's, that's more of a hard culture decision rather than a soft one. That's yep, right. Absolutely. That's right. Hey, you know what I want to talk about today, Cody? I know we've ended our, our sports podcast and because the people in our office made us, we're having too much fun. <laughs> Tracy's right here. No, I'm just kidding. Right. And then this week, the 49ers are qualified to go to the Super Bowl, play the Chiefs. So it'll be a great game. A bad time for us to close that podcast. I know though. it. I know it. But something happened this week that I thought, I got to talk about this. And I even told my kids, I'm going to talk about this. So the 49ers had a player on their team who was a starting cornerback. For those that don't know that he's a defensive back, he tries to keep the receivers from catching the ball. Right. He's been struggling this year. And so he's been getting substituted for a lot. Finally, before the last game, the big playoff game to go to the Super Bowl, they took him out and they put another guy in his place who was playing better. And the guy that got subbed for went to the coaches and said, hey, if I'm not going to start, please let me take all of his plays on special teams, which is a lower level thing, Mm. because I don't want him to be tired when he's in there doing my job. I want him to be really great at it. So basically he said, I want to do the harder stuff for him so he can be more successful. And I am like, that is so Cool. That's amazing. Right. Yeah. The guy that got substituted for was Witherspoon, who did the heroic thing. The guy who went into the game is Mosley. And so Witherspoon, this kid from Colorado, said, Hey, I'll I'll take the I'll take the hard stuff for that's this guy because I want him to be successful. And I love that. And they say that's the whole culture of that team. So I love these little examples from the world of sports. You see it in the world of work all the time, in our personal lives. That's sacrificial and that's teamwork. So yeah. That's right. Way to go, Mr. Witherspoon. I know we're going to have to, we're going to work some of those other sports stories into this podcast every now and again. So I'm glad that you brought that up. All righty. So today's podcast brought to you by Mucinex. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I love Mucinex. I've never heard of it before. They, I thought they had invented everything. But anyway, Meanwhile, thank you, Mucinex. Like a pile of halls. Of halls. <laughs> halls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cough drops over here. But today we want to just make sure everybody knows that hard culture is the real business. Soft culture is really the is. extra stuff. Let's focus on the right stuff. Thanks for listening to us today. We'll talk to you next week. God bless.